Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Bava Kama Daf Tzaditet. I will warn you, this is a long daf. Um, Shabbat stuff is very short, so it'll balance itself out. This week's learning is dedicated by Phyllis and Yessi Heft in loving memory of Phyllis's father, her of Yerachmiel bin Yamin ben Zalman Tzvi Witkin, on his 15th year at Saif, it was yesterday. Jerry Witkin, as he was affectionately known to all, he was a Yosher Lev, Chaber Lechor Echa Samech Bechelko, Lechor Echa Samech Bechelko, and a man who personified the Kom Shein Ish, Ish Tadeliot Ish. You were so missed, and we have been so blessed. Be he Zifro Bahuv. We're going to get started now with the bottom of Tzadi Chet Amud Bet. Okay, we're going to start from here. We're going to end a little bit before the end of the daf because it really starts a new topic. And as Shabbat stuff was short, I took the liberty to say, let's add that on to Shabbat stuff. So we're going to start here with this issue that we saw in the mission. The mission was you give uh, a craftsman something to cre- something to do for you, to fix an item, or maybe to create an item. That's the whole debate here. And they break it. So what happens, right? So classic, you know, you bring something to a seamstress, material, and then they make something and they ruin it. Or you bring them a dress to fix, and then they, you know, spill something on the dress and stain it, and now it's no good anymore. So clearly, if you brought them a dress and it was already made and it got ruined, they have to compensate you for it. But if you brought them the material, okay, it's not clear from the mission in which case they're talking about. The mission brings two cases where it just says you bring an uman, a craftsman, something to fix and they destroy it. Or you bring, but litakane sounds like, to, right, that's to fix. And then it says, or you give a carpenter a shidate varamigdal, it's closet or box or structure type thing, and they break it which sounds like one in the same case. Ravasi says they are one in the same case. And basically, we saw yesterday, what he says is this: the, first, the second line comes to explain what we mean in the first line. And we don't mean the case where you brought raw materials, they created a dress, and then ruined it. If that happens, they just have to give you back the value of the materials you brought. But they don't have to give you back the sheva, the enhancements. The fact that it became a dress, they don't owe you the dress, because why? Because according to Rav Asi, Uman Kone B'Sheva Kli, this is going to be the topic for the first half of our daf. Uman Kone B'Sheva Kli means, okay, we're going to talk about a Numan, a Sahir, talk about all different concepts that really come up a lot in Baba Metziah, which is about different kind of workers. There's workers who work by the hour. Hey, they get paid per hour. There's workers who work for a job. You hire someone to do a job. You hire someone to, to um, do a, um, uh, what's the word? Oh my goodness. I can't remember all my words. Okay. But you, you hire someone, you know, a contractor to, I can't think of the word in English, to do what she puts in your house to uh, renovations. Thank you. To do renovations in your house. So you pay for the job. You don't pay for hour, right? It would be bad because they always end up taking way longer than you think. Um, so that's a job. And usually, and that we're going to get to later, maybe not always, is a craftsman type job. where They're creating something. Okay. Let's say it would be different than... Um, well, I'll get to the case that's different later. So the way it works when you hire someone to do creative job, we're creating something out of something else, like a dress, like a seamstress, you know, or a tailor. So according to Rav Asi, the way it works is not like a worker who works per hour, okay, which is a sahir. It's more like, it's called a kablan, where you hire someone to do a job, like a, a contractor, you hire them to do a job. By the way, there's all sorts of ramifications for this in Hochot Shabbat. Can they do the work on Shabbat? Let's say they're not Jewish. If you hire them for the job and they decide to do it on Shabbat on their own time, that's their issue. If you hire them per hour, you can't pay them. You can't have them do work for you on Shabbat. So there's all sorts of ramifications about Sahir Umar. But about this issue, he says, when they do the job for you and you pay them at the end, it's as if you're purchasing a new object from them. So you gave them material that was worth 100 now they turned it into a dress that's worth 150. That 50, you're actually, it's like a, a sale. You're buying the 50 from them. It's as if they own the dress. Now they own the shabbat, they own the 50, the enhancements they made on it. And you pay them for it, which means they're not a worker. They're a seller. This is gonna have all sorts of ramifications. Like for example, I'll, I'll introduce some concepts that we're gonna see. What about the issue of Baal Yalin? You're not allowed to delay paying your workers. Well, if these aren't workers, then you can delay. If they're more like a salesman and they're selling you something, then there's no issue of Baal Yalin when it comes to a sale. A, a sale. If I buy something and I say, oh, I'll pay you another day, there's no limit. I mean, obviously I have to pay you, but it's not like I have to pay that day. There is no such thing. So that's a sale. That's not an employment relationship. So it's a very interesting 
question how we view this. So that's what Ravasi says. Uman kone b'shevachli. They acquire the enhancements, in which case it's not yours at all. So therefore, if something happens to it, they just have to return you the raw materials, but not the enhancement. So then we said that the Mishnah is read as not two separate cases. One is you give them the raw materials and they ruin it. And the second is that you give them the the finished item to fix and then, you know, to fix up something and then they ruin it. No, both are the same case. So now we're up to Hachinami Mistabra, four lines from the bottom. I can further prove to Kate Sankatani that the Mishnah is really saying the second line is coming to explain the first, and it's not two different cases. To Isla Kadata, Horesha Itzim, if you thought the first case was just giving them the raw materials, Hashta Ashmina Nitzim Chayim Lashanem Velo Amrina, Nurman Kone Beshevach Kelim, Shidat Yavam Vidam Bebaya. If the first case was you gave them raw materials, again, it didn't really say what you gave them, it just said Litaknan to fix them. Which again, fixing even means usually to fix, not to create. But let's assume it means to create. And then you would say, okay, if you give them the raw materials, they have to pay. Well, then of course, that means anyone could ever have a Well, then of course, if you give them a shidate val and they break it, they're going to have to pay. You wouldn't need the second case. So that's their proof. To which they say, what are you talking about? Imishum halo iria, that's not a proof at all. So they're not saying Ravasi is wrong. They're just saying you can't really prove it from the words of the Mishnah. Halo iria, time to say for the Galui Rasha. No, this is a very typical structure of a Mishnah. The Seifa is coming to explain these two cases so that you know what the first case is. In other words, if you just said they give Kalim to fix, you might have thought it meant raw materials. Comes the second line to say, no, no, no. It really means, this is what it means. And then, If you just gave one case and you said, let's say you said, what would you think? You think, would know. So if you have one case, you would have thought it was the Shidate Baal Migdal case. So that's why you need both cases. That's why you need two to say, oh, it's actually both cases. Because one case, you would have assumed it meant the, the more likely case to be liable, the Shidate Baal Migdal. That's why you need two to explain, and that's the opposite interpretation of Ravasi, and that would be reading the mission in a different way to not really prove Ravasi. Now what we're going to do is we're going to try to bring a, nut, a different Tanaitic source, a Mishnah, that's good, the next Mishnah actually, which will try to prove Ravasi is correct. Lema Maseli, just like we tried to prove it from a Mishnah, we're now going to prove it from the next Mishnah. It says in the next Mishnah, I gave you wool to dye and you burnt it in the pot. So what do you have to give me? Just the value of the wool and not the fact that now it's worth, it was worth more at some point because it was colored, it was dyed. So there you have it. You don't have to pay me the enhancements because right? the one who dyed it, acquired it, the enhancements are theirs and that's why they don't need to return it. That would be a good proof. Now, only if you say, to understand how dyeing works. The way they explain dyeing is that the first moment you put it in the pot, it's not dyed already. It takes time for the dye to seep in. So my love, shik dichola, achar nefila. We're assuming though, when we're talking about when did you burn it, later on in the process, once it already was dyed. And what do you see here? Dikashvacha, right? In that case, there is enhancements and you don't have to pay the enhancements. Ushmami na umanko And therefore you can infer from here, ravasi, that the reason you don't have to return the enhancements is because the enhancements belongs to the dyer. Amar Shmuel, Shmuel says, what are you talking about? You can explain that Mishnah. You can explain that case where there were no enhancements because it burned right away when you put it in the pot. In which case, or the cauldron, I would imagine, was something more like that. In which case, there's no enhancement. If there's no enhancement, well, then, of course, there's no enhancement to pay because it didn't get dyed yet. Aval. Now, according to this, what's Shmuel saying? The first thing you have to realize is Shmuel is just trying to counter this explanation and trying to say, this Mishnah doesn't necessarily prove it, just like we did with our Mishnah. Our Mishnah we tried to use to prove Ravasi, wasn't successful. Now this Mishnah we tried to use to prove Ravasi, not successful. The question is, does Shmuel really believe though what he's saying? And that's what the Gemara is going to say here. So wait, Shmuel, you're saying, according to this, your reading of the Mishnah goes like this. Aval, but if hikdichol achar nefila mai. So you're saying if there were enhancements, you think you would get the Shavach? Me as the original person who gave you the wool. I would get the enhancements as well? If so, does he disagree with Ravasi? What we really want to try to establish, and this is what we're going to do in the whole Amadalev, try to figure out, is there someone who disagrees with the statement of Ravasi? 
didn't like come up as a debate. The Ravasi says this, someone else says that. Now we're going to try to figure out, is there an Amora who disagrees with him? Is it possible there's a Tana who disagrees with him? So, because from what Shmuel's saying, it does sound like he's disagreeing, to which they say, Amar lecha Shmuel, now Shmuel's not here. But Shmuel could explain, Ha'acha b'may askinan, ki gon di tzemer b'samanim d'balabayin, v'tzaba agar yadi hudu shakil. It could be that Shmuel views it tzaba as a different situation. Tzaba, okay, let's try to think about a dyer. Now, I don't know enough about it, but it sounds like, which and the, the way the commentaries understand Shmuel, Shmuel's saying, I gave you not only the wool, also the dye, the materials that you need, you know, the the um, the stuff that you made that, that you put into the pot to dye the material. And all you did was put it in a pot. Now, when we talk about Numan Konebeshavach, we're talking about someone who has a unique talent. Anyone could have done this. Why did I hire you to do it if I could have done it myself? Well, I don't have time. So I wanted you to do it for me. So I'm basically paying you for my time. That makes, that means there's no real enhancements here. I'm just paying you for your hours, right? Usually enhancement, when you charge money for doing something for someone, you charge for your time and you charge for your expertise. In this case, there is no expertise. And the expertise is what we were talking about. And Uman is an experienced craftsman. This is not the case here. And I gave you everything. Now, if, if you brought the raw materials, at least that would add something to it, that it's yours. This is not yours at all. So they say that can't be what Shmuel says because, and then Shmuel wouldn't disagree with Ravasi. He would just say there's a different situation. But he had, you know, Taylor made some love with some money to buy it. It should have said, right? Now, first of all, it says, you know, you gave Tzemer to the Tzaba. Okay. So first of all, it didn't say Tzemer and some money, but that, okay. You could say whatever you gave the, the Tzemer, the wool, and we can include the some money. But at the end, it says, if he burns it, you have to give to made some low. You have to return the value of the wool. Now, at that point, it would say the value of the wool, right? If I gave it to you, you would have to return the value of the wool and you would have to return me the value, the value of all the materials I gave you. So it can't be. So in the end, they say, well, in order to say that maybe Shmuel doesn't disagree with Ravasi, you could explain it that he was just playing devil's advocate with, with Ravasi. He doesn't really disagree with him. He was just saying, you can't use this mission to prove it. He was just trying to dis. You know, to knock out the attempted proof from the other Mishnah for Ravasi. It doesn't mean he disagrees with him. He's just saying you can't prove it from there. And that's a better way to understand Shmuel in the sense that it's not clear that Shmuel disagrees with Ravasi. Now we're going to bring a difficulty against Ravasi. So we brought a Mishnah for a proof. Our Mishnah for, as a proof didn't work. We brought the next Mishnah as a proof didn't work. Now we're going to actually raise a source that there's a problem with Ravasi. Tashma. Hanotein talito uman. I give my talit to an uman to fix up. Okay, Gemaro Vahudio. Here's a fascinating topic, which has all sorts of ramifications also for other things as well. They call you up and they say, it's ready. Okay, let's say you have a car in the in the shop and you don't, you know, and the car, now while they're fixing the car, they assume responsibility. Okay, right now, this isn't the issue we're talking about, but it's such an interesting issue. I'm just going to mention it. If we're going to get to this in Baba Metzia, if, right, this is all promo for our next Masechet. If I leave my car in the in the shop after it's already ready. They call me and they say it's ready. And I don't come pick it up for another month. Okay? Now, who's responsible for it all that time? Right? And in a sense, they were done with it. I didn't pick it up. Okay? So here, we're going to talk about a different issue, which is, I owe money from the moment they call me and say it's ready. What if I don't pay? Is that a problem? That I'm pushing off payment for my worker? So, once they call and say it's finished, hodio. There's no isur of lo talim here. Even from here to 10 days, which really means however long. Now, by the way, there's an, there's a, there's an issue here because they have my item. Because they have my item, even though I didn't pay them, they could always, right, you leave your car forever and the musaf, they'll just take you and use your car, right? But they have collateral almost there. So that's why also there's a, there's a thing. There's another element here. In any case, there's no problem of lo talim. We're going to look at this from a very particular eye, what we're looking for, but it, it's a very interesting topic in general. Nitanalo yom. But if they gave it to you by, the, by midday, In other words, you go collect it by midday. Well, by shkia, that day, by sunset, you're already, the clock starts ticking with bal talim. If you don't pay them, you're holding back salary. Now, this is a big problem for Ravasi because isa pedata human Am I over here Baltalin? There is no Baltalin. Baltalin is a category for an employer employee relationship where you hired someone to do something for you. This is a case where 
they're in Uman, they own it, and they're basically selling it back to you at the end. That's a sale. That's not a that's not a, a job. That's not you're hiring them as a worker. So there is no baltalim, right? Like I said, when it comes to a sale, I mentioned this at the beginning of class. There is no such thing as baltalim when it comes to a, a relationship between a store owner and someone who purchases them. So this makes no sense according to Ravasi. So um, and then Tanitic source problem. So Amr of Mary Bered Rav Kahana begarded the Sar Belad de Leka He says, ah, let's explain it's a case where you have this thick kind of garment that needed softening, where it's not really Sheva, okay? It's sort of softening, cleaning. There's a debate about exactly how to understand it, but let's say it's to clean the gar garment that they would do somehow by softening it. But there's no enhancement to the Talit. This wasn't a case of, I'm, I'm creating something, I'm taking your dress and I'm turning it into a fancier dress or something. No, this is, there's no Sheva, to which they say, if there's no enhancement to the clothes, self why are you giving it to him? That is enhancement by you cleaning my garment. Okay, this is basically saying if I bring something for dry cleaning, right? That is enhancing the garment because it's cleaning it, it's making it better than it was before. So you can't say that. That's not a good answer. Then it still would be Shevach and it would still be Uman Koneva Shevach clean. This is fascinating. It's because you can learn about how they did cleaning and softening of clothing. They would do this action of beating the clothes, and that would soften it and, I think, clean it, right? The way you would take a, you know, sometimes I clean the rugs in my car, right? You smack them against the wall. And then, This is a way of hiring someone to clean in a way that it's more like you're hiring them as a worker. Why? Because you pay for each smack of the clothing that they do, okay? This action of bicha, okay? I don't know exactly how it worked. But you would pay, I would go, instead of saying, I want a clean shirt, I would say, or garment, I want you to do 10 bitty shot on my, on my shirt. And then it would be, I would pay you for how many you did. And that would be a job. That's not umanko nebeshevachli, because I'm paying you per, not for a finished complete job. Okay, like if we go back to the renovations, that's a finished complete job. It's not, you know, I'm hiring you for an, you know, an 10, you know, paint, uh, 10, uh, you know, uh, you took the brush and 10 brushes of paint on my wall. You don't do it like that. So that would be another way of explaining it. So now they say, Ulamai, and then it would be Sirut. Ulamai to Salakadatami, Karadilo, Adre the Biche, Misayan and Rav Sheshem. Well, when they originally thought, when in the beginning of the section, that it was a Libiche, and then it would be an Umanut, basically, I'm hiring them or Kavlanut for a job, a contractual job. Well, then, if we understood that source that way, this could support Rav Sheshet. Who's Rav Sheshet? In other words, this source, as always, we can maybe explain the source this way. We can maybe explain it that way. If we explain it that it is more like what Rav Asi was talking about, but the halacha is different, then maybe this would support Rav Sheshet. What did Rav Sheshet say? They asked Rav Sheshet, in Kablanut, which is contractual work, which we assume is equated with Uman, because you're hiring them to do a, tr a, a job through their trade and not, you know, a very particular job like bitchy, bitchy, you know, each bitush for a certain amount, but you're hiring them for a full, complete job. Is there Baltalin or not? Is there a problem of delaying payment? Now, remember, what were Ravasi say? No, there isn't, because it's like a seller. But Rav Sheshit said, oh, well, this is a problem of Baltalin. So what do you have here? Again, you seem to have someone who disagrees with, with, um, Rav Asi, because he seems to say Kablanut, which we equate with Uman, is not like a sale. It's more like an employer, you a worker. So they say no. Olema, they say, uh, so Lema de Rav Shesha, Pliga de Rav Asi. It sounds like he disagrees with Rav Asi. Amr Shmuel Barachan, this is what I referenced in the beginning, that maybe there's something in between. That in Uman is one extreme. Sahir is the other extreme, right? We have an Uman, we have a day worker, you know, someone who who, you know, does a job that kind of anyone can do. It doesn't require any unique talent. Then you have something in between, which is kablanut. Okay, it's contractual work, but it's not an uman. Okay, what does that mean? Well, what's an uman? A craftsman. That doesn't mean a contractor, right? It's not the same thing. A mail deliverer. When I hire you to deliver my mail, I don't hire you for the hours it's going to take you to deliver the mail. I hire you to get my package from here to there. That's a kablan, a, con a contractual job. But it's not enhancing anything. You're just getting my letter from there to there. 
So when Rav Shesha was asked about Kabbalanut, and he says there is Baltaling, that was something like a mailman, where there is no Sheva. But when you have a specialist who adds enhancements to the object, that's a different story. Then they're like a seller. So we now end up with a range of three different types of things and the halacha for each. So that's an interesting, uh, so that's more like the one of the, the letter deliverer, since there's no enhancements, then it comes under the category of a regular worker. And then there would be baltalin, because you wouldn't say they're selling you a finished product in the end. That's certainly not the way it is. So it's just very interesting. We tried to see the Shemot disagreed. We tried to see the Shrof Sheshit disagree. In the end, it's not clear. And we learned all sorts of interesting things along the way. Lema Kitanai. Our next big section is to say, and this is the study guide for today starts here. There's a big chart about it. We're now going to suggest perhaps there's a machloga tanaim here about whether Uman Kone B'Shavachli or not. And this is going to be a great review of a ton of different sugyot that we saw. It's a, it's a Kiddushin sugyot. So a woman goes to a man and she says, he's a goldsmith. She goes to him, brings her, him his, her gold. Make me necklace, bracelet, earrings, ring, whatever, out of this. And with your work, I will be betrothed to you. Okay? Basically, in other words, she is, a Kadesh L'cha, she's saying, I won't pay, you know, you... You'll give me back those items, and with that, it will be a gift to me that I won't have to pay you for your work, and with that, I will be betrothed to you. Kevan Asan, very unclear language. As soon as he makes it, it sounds like as soon as he makes it, but it's still in his possession, Mikudesha, which can't possibly be because she has to receive something. The simple reading sounds like Rabbi Meir says it's her, she's Mikudesha as soon as he creates the jewelry, and um, Chachamim, in a kind of weird way, say she's only Mikudesha when the mamon, mamon is usually money, which here would mean jewelry, gets to her possession. My mamon, but what is mamon here? Ile ma oto mamon. If you're talking about the jewelry, well, then Rabbi Meir makes no sense. Michlaud Rabbi Meir sever oto mamon lo, doesn't have to reach her hands, well, then she got nothing if it stays in his possession. Ella, but my makacha, so there's no, there's kiddushin based on nothing. Ella, pshita my mamon, mamon achia. It must be. The word Rabbi Meir is saying, Kevan Chasa'an means if he makes the jewelry and he gives it to her, that's a good kiddushin. And Rabbi, um, and the rabbis say, no, he has to give her something else. I don't know if you remember this, but maybe as we go on, you'll start remembering this. Story. So now, what's the machloka here? Well, Savrua, to Kule Now we're going to get into all sorts of issues, okay? The first way of reading it, we're going to say the whole machloka is, is Uman Kone B'Shabakli or not? And we'll see in a minute how we get there. But to understand this, you have to understand some basics, like, if he, it was viewed as hiring, now when you hire someone, according to this, is a machloket, but they're going to say that's not the machloket that we're dealing with here. But there's a big machloket, we've seen this before, when you hire someone or you rent something, does the obligation to pay kick in right away or only at the end? Now, either which way you're going to pay at the end. The question is, were you already obligated from the moment you started using it or the moment you started working, were they obligated to pay you? So when this person takes her gold and starts working, is she obligated to pay him immediately? If so, when does she really pay him? At the end, when the finished product is done. And then she says, okay, well, he says, you don't have to pay me. And with that, you'll be betrothed to me. But that is viewed as a loan because if it, you say it kicks in, starts the obligation to pay starts right away. That means that all the time he was making it, she owed him money. Which means in the end, when she's theoretically supposed to pay, even though he's going to cancel it, that is viewed as a loan. Now, the second thing to know is that and as everyone holds yesh and that's not everyone, but everyone in this machloket, and and everyone here holds an opinion that we already learned in Kiddushin, that you can't betroth the woman by canceling a loan. That's not, doesn't work for Kiddushin. So, if so, what's the machloket here? Because then, if it's a loan, this shouldn't work. Well, only if we view this as schirut. If we view this as he's selling it to her, then obviously the sale is only going to be at the very end. When he gives her back the jewelry, it's as if there's a sale, and he says, you don't have to pay me for the sale, and then she's betrothed. It's a gift. And that would work. That's Rabbi Meir. So Rabbi Meir, Savar, Uman, Kone, B'Shavachli, and therefore the whole issue, while he holds schirut, maybe starts at the beginning. This isn't schirut at all, because that's Ravasi. And Rabbanan, Savar, Ein, Uman, Kone, B'Shavachli, which puts it in the world of schirut, it is hers all along. She's paying him rent, like she's paying him for a job. The job, the obligation kicks in right from the beginning. It becomes a loan. Once it's a loan, well, he cancels the loan at the end. You can't throw the woman with that. That's the whole thing. I'm not gonna, I can't get into everything today. So we'll never finish the daf. That's all so good we learned why that is in Kiddush. So now, 
That's option number one, which then says, ah, it's Machloket Tanaim, whether we hold by Rav Asi or not. To which the Gemara is now going to say, no, it's possible. There's three other possible Machloket going on here, which they already kind of alluded to in, by telling you the background that, oh, everyone agrees about this. Maybe not everyone agrees about this, and maybe that's the Machloket. So, second option. Um... No, everyone agrees. Uman does not acquire it. Meaning, right, you could say nobody agrees with Ravasi. Or, or you could just say this has nothing to do with Umanut. This is a schirut job. She hired him to do, oh, sorry. If, I, you would have to say, which means that everyone views this as a job of schirut. He's a worker. And now the question is, when does the obligation kick in for her to pay? So, yeshna the schirut mitchila ba'ad sof kamifliye. The machloket is about whether we hold the obligation kicks in from the beginning, which would turn it into a loan, or the obligation only kicks in at the end, which would mean that he could actually betroth her in this way. So, Rabbi Meir savar in the schirut ele lava sof. The obligation to pay for for a job, a schirut job, is only at the end, and therefore he can betroth her in this way. In which case it's a loan, in which case it doesn't work. Third possibility. Everyone agrees it's a loan. But what's the machloket? Okay, this is like just changing each permutation, each, each element. Rabbi Meir disagrees with this whole opinion that you can't betroth someone by canceling a loan. He thinks you can betroth the woman by canceling a loan. Wasn't a mainstream opinion, but there was that opinion. And the rabbis say, no way, no how. And that's why the rabbis say, you have to add something else. And that's why Rabbi Meir says, this is totally fine. Turning now to Amabet, we now get to the fourth explanation. Everyone agrees. Actually, Sirut starts off from the beginning. It's a law. And everyone agrees, you can't do this. Okay? I'm alone, you can't betroth him. So what's going on here? How can Rabbi Meir say it works? Well, dekula en en dekula alma enu man kone b'shavachli, and everybody views this goldsmith as a worker, not as a craftsman <coughs> that acquires it and is selling it back to her. Ella, how far am I asking? And so, what are we talking about here? You add a new element, which we also learned this whole machloket. Kigon shows siflan nofach mishalom when she gave him the gold. Excuse me for a second. When he gave her the, when she gave him the gold and he made jewelry out of it, he added a stone of his own. So then what he's betrothing her is with that stone. And does that work? Why wouldn't it work? Now you have something new, something that's his. So now you have to explain the rabbis why they think it doesn't work. Well, Rabbi Meir Savar, milva upruta data pruta. If someone betrothes a woman by canceling a loan and adding some money of his own, the woman knows. She's smart. She knows the halacha. She knows, right? This is an interesting thing. Do women know or not know? She knows that she, he can't betroth her by canceling the loan, and she understands that what he really means is, I'm betrothing you with the coin, okay? With this one little coin, right? Let's say the loan is a thousand shekels, but this one coin, which again, if you remember from Kedushin, you have to betroth the woman with something that's worth a pruta, okay? It has to be at least worth something. So when he betrothes her with something very expensive, canceling a loan and some little small thing. Well, she knows though that the loan doesn't work. So she's focusing on the pruta and she's accepting the betrothal. That works. So according to him, <clears throat> he gives back this nice gold jewelry, but it's really the stone that he's betrothing her with and she knows that and she accepts it for her betrothal. Rabbanan Safri, milva pruta datea milva. When you return nice, beautiful gold jewelry and say, oh, I'm not going to charge you for this. And in it, he happens to put one little stone, which is kind of, you know, not significant compared to the rest of the jewelry, or a thousand check alone that he's canceling and says, I'm betrothing you with canceling the loan and this little one coin. She assumes that the betrothal is for the whole big amount. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, it's not. And that means if she realized he was betrothing her with a pruta, she would say, what a humiliation. I'm not getting betrothed to you for some little silly coin. That's nothing. That's worth nothing. You know, you know, here, the stone is probably worth something, but it's not worth something compared to. And it's, it's a matter of what she agreed to. She agreed to be betrothed for a big amount. And it's not the case because she can't be betrothed by that big amount because that's just a canceling of a loan. Or in our case, that's how we're viewing it because it's root. She owed him money starting from the moment he started working. All that time, she didn't pay him. She pays him at the end. That is like, and he says, you don't have to pay me. 
that's canceling a loan because it's viewed as a loan. So that's their machloket. And by the way, this machloket we can see in a different source. And it'll take us a little time to see, but we're going to see a three-way machloket. The first two are disagreeing about a different issue that we discussed, and the second two are going to be disagreeing about this issue. If he says, listen, I'm going to betroth you because of, on account of work I already did for you. Now, everyone agrees that that's not going to work because that means he finished the work already. She hasn't paid him yet. That's clearly viewed as a loan because it's money. She hasn't paid him from before. So, but I'm going to betroth you now on account of work I'm going to do for you. She will be mekudeshet. Rabbi Yinatan Omer, v'sachal she'esei imach ene mekudeshet, v'koshach chem v'sachal she'asit imach. If future work, it also doesn't work. And if future work doesn't work, obviously past work won't work, because that for sure is a loan. The question is, what about future work? Is that a loan or not? And in a minute, we'll see what the debate is about. Rabbi Yehuda Nasi Omer, be'emet amru, that really usually means we hold this way. Be'em v'sachal she'asit imach, be'em v'sachal she'esei imach ene mekudeshet, just like Rabbi Yinatan. Neither way is it going to work. But he adds the following element, which is what we're looking for. But if he adds something of his own, then she's mekudesh. So my ikab, whether you read those words or not, but it's the meaning. My ikab bein tanakama le rabinatan. It's in parentheses, the words my ikab. What's the difference between tanakama and rabinatan? Ikab bein ayu schirut. Their machloket is, yesh nal schirut mitzchila vatsof or not. If you hold, what's their debate about? Future loans. If he says you'll be betrothed to me based on work I will do in the future, not future loans, sorry, I said it wrong. Work I will do for you in the future. Now, if work is paid only at the end and she does not really obligate it to pay it until the very last moment, then it could work. That's the that's the first opinion that says this works because she only owes the money at the end. And at that moment, he says, I'm betrothed to you. You don't have to pay me the money. It's not a loan. But if you hold, yes, on this three it's going to from the moment he starts working for her, she owes him the money already. And, but even though she only pays at the end, then it's viewed as a loan and that won't work even though it's future, it's still going to be become a loan. Bein Rabbi Natan, the Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, Ikabinai, what about the last two? Ah, Milvo Pruta. Because the rabbi said, it doesn't work if you go on some future work I'll do for you, even if you add he adds something of his own because she'll think it's on the Milvo and the, and the Pruta and whatever he adds. And Rabbi Yehuda Nasi says, no, as long as he adds something else, she'll understand that the something else is what the betrothal is all about, and that will work. Okay, and that's just saying that there's the same machloket as we had before. So summary of what we did so far, we had this case in the Mishnah of bringing something to someone, and then they basically have to repay you for the enhancement. And then we said, that's only if, right, they only have to pay for enhancements if they fix something that was in existence. But if they created something, Right then, right if they bro- oh, sorry if they broke no, I said that wrong. If they break your item, then they have to return a complete item. If you brought them a full item, they have to return the complete item. But if you brought them raw materials, Rav Ansi says, and they turned it into something, they wouldn't have to pay you for the enhancements. Okay, the case of the mission doesn't have enhancements. If there are enhancements, they don't have to pay because uman kuneb shavachli, which means that it's really theirs. So they didn't damage your enhancements because it wasn't yours for them to have damaged. And then that meant that he used this whole thing as a sale, and that got us all into all these questions on him, right? Either sources to try to prove or sources to go against him, all discussing this issue of, according to Rav Asi, it's more like a sale. It's not like a worker-laborer relationship, and which would put it in a different category, both in the issue of Baltalim, of delaying payment, and all sorts of other issues that we saw along the way. Now we're going to move on to another topic similar. Now we're going to talk about, and this will take us in through tomorrow's stuff as well, Amr Shmuel, I'll already just start. Tabach uman shekilkel chayav l'shalem. If you have a butcher, you give a butcher, now it's different in our day, we don't bring the, the animal to the butcher to slaughter, but in those days they would bring an animal to the butcher to slaughter, and the, the, butcher, the slaughterer ruins your meat, okay? Starts slaughtering, makes a mistake, okay? How do we view this person's mistake? Now here there's a big debate about whether we view this in this, the world of shomrim, because it's like, you gave me both, let's assume I'm the slaughterer, you gave me your item, I'm now kind of watching your item while it's in my possession, and then I mess it up. And then it might depend, shomer chinam, shomer sachar, okay? Um, if if you paid me, and this is one of the debates we're going to get into, is it different if you paid me, or is it different if I did it for free? Perhaps if I did it for free, I'm not liable because I, I have less responsibilities as shomer chinam, as a, someone who watches for free. Some people say this has nothing to do with shomer, it's more the world of Adama Mazik. 
And then the question is, where are you on the scale? This goes back to, okay, anyone who damages is liable. What about onus? If you remember, there was a whole debate in the beginning of the Masechet. The, the commentaries have not directly addressed or that was addressed by cases, and this would be another case of that. Do we view this as really onus? And, and then we're going to distinguish, if you're an expert, you're not an expert. If you're an expert, then maybe it's really onus that you made a mistake. And if it's really onus, then maybe we'll exempt you. But if it's, you know, you were somewhat responsible, then we're going to make you responsible. So it's a, it's a bit of a debate, and I'm not going to get into this whole topic. It's a debate among the commentaries under what category are we viewing this, Adama Mazik or, or Shomri. It's just an interesting thing, but we're going to try to stick with the shot here. So we're going to have a major debate between Shmuel and, and Rabbi Yochanan, okay, which we'll see later, which is, let's start with Shmuel. So you have a guy who takes your animal, slaughters it, messes it up. But they're an expert. They're a known slaughterer. He damaged you. He's a, he did it. It, 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 says, you know, he did something wrong. It usually means intentionally. This isn't necessarily intentional. And it's like you said to him, go slaughter from here, and you slaughtered it from there. Meaning, you know, go slaughter right on the neck there, and you slaughtered it on from the back. Okay? You're really in the wrong. Okay, so the Gemara says, oh, so why, why do you have to use both those terms? What did he gain from saying that? Well, if you just said he damaged, you would have thought, Hanimile, uh, Havamina, I would have thought, Hanimile, this is only if you hired him to do the job. But maybe if he did it for free, you would say no. Okay, that's what I said before. Maybe there's a difference. That's why he said Poshe. So we're now understanding Shmuel. He thinks it doesn't matter. A Numan is going to be responsible no matter what. Rashi says, and of course, someone who's not a Numan, because if someone who's not a Numan, and this we'll get into more tomorrow, if you're a head yote, and you say, oh, I'll slaughter your animal. Of course you're responsible. What were you doing getting involved in something you have no idea how to do? That's for sure your responsibility. But even someone who's an expert and probably really just made a mistake, he says, I don't care if you got my pay for it, didn't get paid for it, you're liable no matter what. So before we get to Rabbi Yochanan, who's going to disagree with him, first they bring a ton of inic source that seems to disagree. So you gave it to a tabach and he slaughters it wrong and now it becomes a nevela. Can't be uman patul hediyot chayav. Here we have the distinction. If you're an uman, you're an expert, you're actually exempt. If you're a regular person who, what were you doing doing this, you're obviously going to be responsible. Ve'im noten sachar, but if you paid the uman money, which now understand, oh, you're exempt because you didn't pay him money. And then he doesn't assume responsibility. This, by the way, seems to fit well into shomer chinam, shomer sachar. Shomer chinam is, is liable for less things than a shomer sachar. Okay, so Shomer Chinam can get out of Geneva and Aveda and all those things only if they're really Poshea, they really did it wrong, you know, misuse the, the, use the item, let's say, that they gave him to watch when he shouldn't have or something. Broke it, then he'd be liable, but otherwise not. But if they got paid, either which way you'd be chayav. So he brings this question against Shmuel, to which sounds like a good contradiction, to which Shmuel reacts very harshly. Your brain should be muddled. Okay, you don't know what you're talking about. Okay, it means basically your brain is muddled because you're asking me this question. He doesn't even explain to him why, but the same thing happens again. Atume Rabban and another rabbi comes, Kamotivle, and he asks him the same question. You're going to get the same thing your friend got, this curse for me. But here he actually explains to him. Kamina lechuana, Rabbi Meir. Kamalitu li, Rabbanan. Amailu diakta milai. Shani omeo maziku posheo nase kome lishchog mikam vishachalu mikam. Okay, I read a lot, but what this basically means in very simple terms, he said, you question me from Rabbi Meir, uh, for, you question me from the rabbis, I was holding like Rabbi Meir. In other words, I hold by the town of Rabbi Meir. You brought me a source to contradict. That's the rabbi's opinion. Why? What can I tell you? Well, and then he says, why am I upset with you? Because you didn't look into what I said. What I said was based on Rabbi Meir. And now we're going to have to figure out Rabbi Meir. Because Rabbi Meir, because I said, when you tell someone to do something, it's like, you know, when, when I do it wrong, it's like you told me do this and I did that, right? You told me A and I did B. And that's how we view it. And therefore, I'm responsible no matter what. And that is Rabbi Meir who holds, and this is a fascinating machloket, mebaile le mirme This is, a, this is a, 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 an approach to life. We assume people should be careful, okay? Even if they're not getting paid, we assume People, humans should take responsibility for things. They should watch what they're doing. And now we're going to see this in a whole bunch of different issues because we're going to now say, what Rabbi Meir is he talking about? Where did Rabbi Meir say this? 
Okay, we don't have any words anywhere where Mary says people have to be extra careful, you know, watch what they're doing. So let's see. Elay Mahara We're going to bring three sources till we finally find, figure out which one it is. If it's this Mishnah, and now we're going to do a review of all sorts of sugas we saw in this Masechet. I tied up my ox with a, with a, with a leash, or I locked the door, and somehow he got out anyway. If you remember, you has this weird opinion that you're actually more liable if you have to protect the short tan more than the short muan. Rabbi Mary thinks you have to protect either which one you're going to be liable for damages, okay? So, what do you see here? He holds you responsible. Even though you did your basic shmira, you still had to, you have to watch what your animals, better than just basic. We have high expectations for people. So, can't say it's that one, because hatam b'kraiklinge, that's a unique Machloket specifically there on how to understand the words, lo yishmerenu ba'alav, and there's a whole machloket there. We'll go back there and see, but that's not to be learned for everything else. It's unique there. El ahara bimer ditnan, the next Mishnah, which we read already a few times. Litzba lo adom utzva o shachol, shachol ho utzva o adom. Rabbi Meir, Meir, no tenlut meit samro. So they say, okay, I give you my, my wool to dye black, and you dye it red. Okay, now we assume you, you did it by accident, but... Rabbi Meir says you have to return the value of what you ruined. You can't just give it to me and say, tough luck, take your black wool, even though you really want it red. So I'm responsible. Now, why? It was a, an honest mistake. I wasn't paying attention. But come on, what do you mean you weren't paying attention? You'd be annoyed if somebody did that to you. Why aren't you paying attention? We have high expectations for you. You have to pay attention to these things. So they say, no, that's different because how to be a dying clo'omine. The way he reads this now is that you intentionally did I knew you wanted it red, and I dyed it black because I always have black dye in my in my studio. I didn't have red, and I did it. No, I, I just it wasn't that I was mean about it. I just didn't think you cared. You wanted it dyed. What's the difference whether you want it black or red? So I haven't had black. I just did it black. So then that's different. That's not. It was wasn't negligence that caused this. Ella hara be married to Tanan Nishbarach Kadov Lo Silka Naflag Am Lo Velo Hemi Dye. You might remember this. Right, my car breaks and I didn't pick it up off the floor. My cow falls and I didn't pick it up and it caused damage. Rabbi Meir Omer Chayav Benizkan. I'm liable for all the damages that get caused. I'm only Chayav Klape God, but not in the human court. If you remember, what was the Machlok at there? It's, it was that it, I didn't have enough chance to even pick it up. So why would I be responsible? Because I shouldn't have slipped in the first place. Here you have it. That's Rabbi Meir saying, you have to be careful when you walk in the street not to trip. Because if you trip, you might cause damage, and we're going to make you responsible for that. That's a whole approach. Was Rabbi Meir, was Rabbi say, I'm not going to make you responsible for falling, tripping, that's something else. Okay, so that's what we have. So we started bringing the source against Shmuel, and Shmuel says that's the rabbis I hold by Rabbi Meir. But now we're going to see Rabbi Yochanan disagrees with Shmuel also. I'm a rabbi, Rabbi Hanan, Rabbi Yochanan, Tabachu Mancha Kukel Chayav, Afilu Uman Ketabachetzipori, even if he's like the best of the best. We're still going to hold him responsible, to which they say, that sounds like Shmuel. Does he really say this? There was a case that came before him. Go bring me proof that these guys were specialists in, in slaughtering chickens, and I'll exempt them. So what do you see here? Specialist is not liable. It seems to contradict what Rabbi Yochanan said. Here he passed in the case against what he said. And here comes Rabbi Yochanan. He disagrees with Shmuel, and he distinguishes between whether you got paid or whether you didn't get paid. If you got paid for it, then you're going to be responsible. And they're going to further prove this from someone else. He basically gives some good advice to people, and he says, when you bring your animal to the butcher, pay them up front, okay? But what he really means is pay them because you get what you pay for. If you want to make sure your animal doesn't get messed up, Pay the guy for it, okay? Pay him, and then you, you'll... you Why? Because that will, first of all, he'll know that he has to... You get what you pay for, he'll know he has to be really careful because he'll understand that if he messes it up, he'll have to pay you. As opposed to if they do it for free, where he won't. Metive, wait a minute, this contradicts the following source. Hamalichitim matachon, you bring your, your wheat to get grinded. The lowly tatan, you didn't soak them. Vas an subino morsan, and it became like this bran, which isn't really good. Kemach lenachton, so pani polin, you brought flour to the but to the baker and he made this bread that fell apart. You brought the same thing, an animal to the slaughter and he messed it up. He is like someone who gets paid. That sounds like he doesn't get paid, he's just treated like someone who gets paid. To which they say, no, don't worry about that. It's not like a no say it's because he gets paid. And then this shows 
only when he gets paid or she gets paid are they going to be held responsible. Last part for today. Now we have a, a story. There was a case of a of hagrama. This is a type of slaughtering where you start slaughtering the first siman and then you tilt the knife and it there's a machloket. Rabbi Yes, Rabbi Huda says it's actually kosher and the rabbis say this is not a kosher slaughtering. So there was a case where this happened. Tarfe, so Rav ruled that it was a trefa, not kosher. Upatri the tabak midami, but didn't make the butcher, the slaughterer, pay the money for it. So Pagube Rav Kahana Rav Asi, but Ugavra, Rav Kahana Rav Asi meet this guy who, you know, ended up messed up. His animal got messed up and he didn't get paid back for it. Um Rule, Abibach Rav Tarti. And they said, Rav did two things to you. Now, it sounds like two things in a negative way. So they're gonna ask, my tarte, what are the two? Elam Atarta the Guru is he saying rough pasket against you in two ways that you know in a bad way? Meaning, Dibai Lach Lach Shuik Rabbi Yosi Rabbi Yehuda. Number one, he should have made it said this is kosher, like Rabbi Yosi Rabbi Yehuda holds. Vitarfa Kidurabanan. Um and and instead he said it was a trafe like the rabbis. The inami kirabanan dibai lach you vitabcha. And even if the hill like the rabbis and said it was trafe, he at least should have had the tabach pay you. Which is what we saw here. There's a machlok. Does the back have to pay you or not? So now they say there's no way that was their response to what Rav had done because and this is a fascinating line. Umi shari lemeimar kia gavne. Could they he, they possibly have said this to the guy on the street? The hot time it says in a brayta lachishiet say if you're a judge and you judge a case and it's two against three. Okay, we judge two right by majority and you're the one the dissenting opinion. So you are not allowed to do the following. You can't walk out of court and say, listen, I want to be honest. I thought they were all wrong. I thought it was like this. This is what we always do, right? We have the dissenting opinion. You're not allowed to do that in a Jewish court and come out and say, I disagreed with the judgment. Okay, I'm sure this judgment's also, you know, this is like between two people. We're not talking about a big Supreme Court decision. But you're not allowed to say that. So you're basically tattletaling on people. You know, you're saying, they're the ones who said you're obligated and I really was on your side. Not allowed to do that. So there's no way that they went along and said, Rav should depask in that way. We disagree with him about his psak. There's no way. So we'll end with this last line. They meant in a good way, Rav did two things. Number one, he didn't let you eat meat that was possibly a sur, if we hold like the rabbis against Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Yehuda. And Menachem is zela. Now it's not clear that the butcher should have to pay you. If they made the butcher pay you, perhaps you would have been stealing money from him because maybe really you shouldn't be getting the money from him. So... On account of that, he did two good things for you to protect you from Isulim. Maybe you ended up losing money, but at least you didn't end up doing something wrong. Okay, that's it for today. We don't really have time to summarize, although we at least summarized the beginning part. And we'll stop here for today. Wishing everyone a Shabbat Shalom and a Chodesh Tov. And B'Sorot Tovot.